Welcome back to Michael. How are you doing? How am I doing? And more importantly, how well made? This week we're going to be talking about a cool new cartoon I made called Ballers. This cartoon took about a week to make. It's all done through code. And the amazing thing is that there is no hand-done animation in this cartoon. The cartoon that is quite different from any cartoon that's been on Jack and Jellyfee before. And because of that, I'm really glad about how it turned out. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, are the characters going to look robotic? Are they going to be uh, going to pop from place to place? But seeing the comments uh, really lifted my mood when it was done. I was so glad about how it turned out. Once again, like my previous videos, my amazing library of them, you can follow the pattern. You'll see that this is me talking over footage that is slightly faster, 12 times speed, just a small amount faster, just to speed up, turn the pace up a bit, and me talking over it. Hopefully, these videos are going to get better and better. There is an upward trend that I hope to, you know, reach the peak and become perhaps one of the best video makers on YouTube. Only a matter of time. But right now, we're focused on this video. As you can see here, I'm adding legs to my characters. There's a lot of code that I think could be a little neater, but this was something that I thought was a real fun excursion. I haven't done anything that's like uh, a coding sketchbook, painting with code. There are a lot of people that I admire that are able to do this, and they're just artists who code, and that's amazing. Not me, though. Maybe it'll get better. Check out that crossfade. You see, that was like five frames per second. Anyway, here is me trying to figure out how to get the uh, distribution of the characters right. These characters have to be put on the screen in a way that looks organic, but is also the same every time you run the code. It's deterministic. There's this really great website that I've only seen one page, so I can't really say it's a great website, that is a programmer, I think, making the terrain generation for the Witness, Jonathan Blow's new game. And he talked about how he used concentric circles overlapping and the intersections between those circles are where the plants end up being placed so that you don't ever see any lines going straight through just a bald spot in the plants. And I thought that was really great. That, like, that really stuck in my memory, so I made sure to look it up. And it took me like about probably half a day to get that to work. Once it worked, it was really great. It just felt rock solid. Also, now I know how it works, so I can see the pattern in it. One thing you might not know about this video is that there is one very interesting pattern about these characters that are on the screen and the way they're placed. They're not random at all. I sort the points that are generated by their distance from the center, and then I put the characters in order on those points. But those characters are not shuffled at all. They're in alphabetical order, which means if you start from the center, you're going to see blocky, bubble, corny eraser you know, in alphabetical order. And as you get to the edge, that's why Woody's on the edge. I don't know why gelatin's there, but you can definitely see them go inward to outward, A to Z. I haven't seen that in any of the comments. If you put that comment in Jack and Jellyfy, I'm going to read it and completely ignore it. Here's the ball. I decided to add the ball. Z sorting is something I was also looking forward to. I've always... Something that I really like about 2D stuff that is like in a game or something that's done through code and there's Z-sorting. Something about it makes it feel real but also uh, give, has an artistic direction to it too. There's just something really solid about it that I like. It feels a lot more real when you have that Z-sorting. Pass time. This is uh, 0.5 seconds between when one character passes the ball to another character. Oh wow, the ball's carrying people around. So that's the one thing about Java is that, uh, that these points are objects and these objects are passed by reference. So I accidentally modified that object uh, to be where the ball, to be equal, the ball's position is equal to that current character's position. And then I modify the ball's position. Oh, the, this is my first attempt at getting the characters to look at the ball. It's looking quite good already. You know, when I'm looking around, that's exactly what I do. I'm always... I always got to keep my head sort of, uh, so the top of my head is always in the clockwise direction. Anyway, getting, getting their positions to look a little bit more natural. That's the good thing. I tried to do something exactly like this, probably like six years ago, when I was really, no, not six years ago, probably like nine years ago, eight or nine years ago, 
I was really into Homestar Runner. And I wanted to make this cartoon, this interactive flash thing where you'd have Strong Bad, the character, and his face is masked. And he would be looking at the cursor, but his head would tilt up and down. But if, like, the cursor's on the right side, head tilts that way. On the left side, it tilts that way. But if it's left side and down, then it tilts that way. And I could never get it to work. But then I finally got it to work here, so I'm really glad about that. That was, like, a real progression for me. And here's I'm looking left or right. There's, like, a nonlinear function that I have that takes in the uh, x distance of the ball to the character's body and then puts it through a sigmoid function so that uh, when the ball is near to them, they're practically one-on-one -on -one with the ball. But as it gets further away, they turn slightly less. And I think that worked out pretty well. It's kind of like, like, a, like a surface of a cylinder, but not really. You know, it's all about the visual style and getting it to match what the human's going to draw it as. If we were a 3D model, I would use a 3D model. But instead we have these drawn uh, characters, these BFDI style characters. What's going on now? Oh, Matrix Hell. This is me entering, entering Matrix Hell. Because one thing I, that I'm trying to do right here is get the hips of the legs, the top of the legs, to attach to the character body. This is something you can't do in Flash. It's pretty much impossible in an easy way. In vanilla Flash, with no add-ons, is to have one side of a leg connect to one object and have the other side connect to something that's completely el elsewhere in the hierarchy. So you have the... You, you want the top of the leg to attach to the character body, but then the bottom of the leg attached to something that's outside of the character body. And this is me trying to manually do the matrix math to draw this in world space, but then apply the matrix math to the top of the leg to be in body space. And it's already working. Even though it's only a mere 12 times speed, it's already, uh, it's already done. And I think some people might object to my coding style where I'm adding a tab every time you do push matrix and pop matrix. And I don't know how it's done like in the real big name graphics pipelines, but here in processing, we're all in immediate mode all the time. Every single draw call is done one at a time. And I'm adding a tab. Oh, this is them trying to grab the ball. Did you see for that one moment, uh, they were all grabbing at the same time. And I'm trying to make, make it so that they're switching out. So each one, each character grabs the ball exactly when they need to. And the difficult part here is that their hands kind of swing backward afterward. So there's a spring function. And multiple characters are going to have that spring function going on at once. So you can't just uh, only affect the current character. You have to have multiple characters... Uh, being affected by this at once and at different states based on how far back they did that. Because everything here is completely stateless. I forgot to mention this program is completely stateless. It runs like a shader. There's one function time and outputs the, uh, the image. Because this is stateless, it's really easy to do something that's like time travel where you have a function that inputs the time but then you can change the time that gets input to that. So if you want to have characters lag behind, that's really easy to do. And in this case, we're, uh, we have a function that inputs how far, uh, how far back in time they caught the ball and therefore how much their arm's going to be swinging, how far their arm's going to be lerped toward or away from the ball. And that took me a long time to do. There was a lot of popping, a lot of discontinuities because of this state change between the ball. Not a state change, but... Uh, just getting all the everything to line up, and here's me trying to do that same matrix, matrix application multiplication, and not getting it right at all. I'm having to make another matrix for the body transformation, applying that to the shoulders, not applying that to the to the hands. What I'm trying to do is get the hands to lag behind it as the body turns. Hands take a while to catch up, which means I have two body transformations, and that's what I love so much about this time travel is that I can have the body transformation be a function and have the body transformation at T be the one that's used for the body and the transformation at T minus 0.5 or whatever, that be the one that's applied to the hands. Because of that, you don't have to worry about like any physics simulation or any sort of state that's constantly being carried to the next frame. 
everything's completely pure as it's called because you put it in because the stuff that you get out is completely dependent on the parameters that get put in and that's I think that really made what could have been extremely messy code a lot more easy to understand because you know that it, the, what you get from a function is completely expected there isn't anything that's going to mess it up and because of that you can also jump in at any point in time that's really good or you could have this uh, run at half speed or 60 frames per second or whatever. I'm loving these really smooth crossfades. They're so good. Mask. Oh, this is, this is the worst part. I've had many worst parts. This is the worst, worst part of them all. Is trying to... It's, easy, it's already kind of easy in Flash to, to mask. But there's a lot of uh, fanfare and procedure to get the masking to look right when I'm doing this in processing. And I'm having to actually manually extract the alpha channel from every single pixel and put that in a new image and use that image as the mask to draw the face. And also because I'm transforming the body, you can see that black transparent image is not perfectly aligned with the body. That's already a source of discomfort. I guess I didn't mention it, but yeah, eraser and book, some of the flat characters are skewing. And that's another thing that's really great about being able to access the matrices directly is that you can apply any other transforms you might possibly want. Like, oh, let's throw this variable into this part of the matrix and just get a free skewing effect. And that was really nice. Eventually, the way I ended up solving this was bah, by applying the same transformation to the face as I do to the body. So now the face is a child of the body where it wasn't before. Something, I'm not sure. But if eraser skews, the eyes and mouth are going to skew too, and it wasn't originally like that. And it was difficult. You can see the characters are masking, but eraser is not masking. Eraser is masking, but the graph, the mask, is not aligned with the body. And that's like, oh my god, I see, like I'm trying to make a transform or axis aligned bounding box. You can tell that's already a step down a dark road. If you look, yeah, now you can see that later on, you can see Eraser's body is shifting around. It's now it's being cut off in this way that's completely unexpected. And I'm, now I'm looking up uh, toilet shelves. Oh, wait, the, yeah, the, the shelves in our new apartment are really good. It's great to have that extra storage space. This is a function. Desmos graphing calculator is really useful, by the way. This is a function that I'm using to... Uh, have the amount that a character blinks. So the, the Y value is the blinkness. I call that blinkness. This thing is pausing every now and then. I can't tell if that's just me think, stopping to think in real life or if that's my computer being slow. But yeah, this is our blinkness. And I really like this, how this function turned out because you can change one value and it's going to make the blinks denser or coarser. And it's not going to change the width of each blink. So it's like I'm just like sliding around objects, but I know it's really a fun. And that's really cool. What's next? Curve. Time for blinking. I, the, the eyes were originally drawn as ellipses, but not anymore. Now I want them to turn into boomerangs as they blink. Eyes are really tiny, so I have to blow it up. I have to make the eyes a lot bigger just to be able to see that. So you're going to see that in a moment. Just one short moment, you're going to see... Uh, how I bring up the eyes to make it more clear how I'm going to get the blinkiness variable to affect the shape of the eyes. See, there you go. Those are some very decorative patterns. I don't know what kind of curves they are, these are. Yeah, you can already see the blinking taking shape. I think the blinking is something that turned out really well. That's like the only shape tweeny thing that I have in this cartoon. Now this is me skipping ahead in time. This is the ball. I'm replacing the ball, which used to be an ellipse, just an ellipse function. I'm replacing that with an image. And I think I already wrote a function that will stretch the ball so that there's a bit of a motion blur. But I don't have it in, applied to an image yet. Now this is a weird bug. Uh, I'm not sure why it's popping around, but then it starts to become clear that it's popping to four corners. And then I'm realizing that uh, because of the transformation that I have it set up, I have everything like in unit vector. So the top of the screen is y being 1, bottom of the screen is y, negative 1. But that doesn't work well with the image function because the image function takes in integers. Because it takes in integers, the ball is literally can only be in one of four positions. 
that's a real annoying thing. They have to kind of step out of that to just to draw the ball and then step back in. The unit vectors are really convenient, though. I really recommend that. A lot more than pixel values, definitely. What's going on here? Oh, now I'm applying blinkness. Uh, well, for a moment, I was applying blinkness so that they would blink when their head turns. So that's another thing I like about the time travels, that you can, it's really easy to make derivatives of functions. Like, just any function whatsoever, you can get a derivative of it, just because if you put in the t value and then subtract t, the value at t minus, like, some tiny amount and, and divide it by that tiny amount, you can finally get the derivative, the speed at which they're turning. If they turn too fast, I make it so that they blink. And that's something that I think adds a lot of life to them. Now this is Balmy's wick. This is the part that I'm really glad about. I think it turned out really well. Because people say that it's 3D, it's physics, it's neither of those. It's like really dumb, but it's something that's accomplished entirely by the time travel. There's no physics whatsoever, and it's just really just lagging. It's the same effect that you see applied to all the other characters. I don't know if they're applied to the characters at this point, but the characters all do have some amount of lag in how they're looking, which direction they're looking, and how they're turned. The catching is always completely on sync, though. What's going on here? TF. TF stands for transform. Smear transform. Oh, this is me writing the function that will smear a, an image. Before I had a function to draw a smeared ellipse. But that doesn't work at all for drawing an image because the ellipse, I can give it a width and a height, and it doesn't matter how it's rotated, but I want the ellipse to be like, if this is my image, I don't want to have to rotate it and then stretch it like that. I want it to like actually be smeared, so it's like, in a lot of cases, it's going to be skewed almost. But because of matrix math, uh, the matrix operations where you can rotate, scale, rotate back, it was actually super easy. But it's a great function to have. Now this is like the real, real difficult part, I've said that many times, but this is the difficultest difficult part, is the multiple balls. It's actually made a lot less difficult by the fact that everything is a pure function now, because now what I did here was I just ran the function instead of one time, I ran it four times. And it's like as if I have four alternate universes where the characters are all facing in four alternate universe directions. And then, based on how close the, the nearest ball is to it, I sort of interpolate toward that one. Everything can be controlled by a small number of parameters. So those parameters, I, I weight the parameters in that one alternate dimension the highest. I'm not explaining this very well at all, but if you look at the code, I think it might become more clear if you are able to read the code. And... That's why I saw some comments saying that it became clear that it was like computery because uh, the characters were getting locked up. They're not really getting locked up. There's no locking up to do because there's no time variant stuff. Check in to step two, the part two. This is where this is where I do the music and the background.